Hustle. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing official, Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Not none of you know my dad walk on. Man, hold up, man. Hey, man. I got this lady in here today, y'all. She's special, man. Uh, when I first started this uh, podcast, it was a certain group of people that I tried to tap into. And most of them was affiliated with Pimp. You already know mm -hmm. that. Everybody we done had. It's only right that I have Julie Beverly, Julia Beverly in here, yes. right? Yes. Man, thank Yay. you. We don't have a clapper. <laughs> you actually do on the roadcast. I I, okay, when I first I can, I can clap for when myself, I first right? started, that my brother, I think he said, "Turn that off. That sounds cheesy." When he just clapped. <laughs> oh, you had a little yeah. sound effect. I, I like the clapping sound you do? effect. I would feel honored. Yeah. <laughs> so, man, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. good man, good you, Dallas. you, you, something else, man. I, I when I looked at what you've done, your body of work, everything sticks out that says you are part of this culture. And I'm like, wow, man, where did she come from? She was heaven sent, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? But my wife, I know how you do it, so I'm gonna get back, because I don't want to get slapped. Yeah. <laughs> see, when you look at that, when I look on her social media, I have to see all the traveling, I'm like, oh my God, I wish I, all these places you've been, it's amazing. I'm like, I have been, I have been getting around. It's been, it's been a, <laughs> it's been a great summer. I, I actually flew in um, from Kuwait last night. I was, what? Uh, yeah, I saw that. I was shooting a, a military tour over there, mm -hmm. so that was because you were in the, like in a prison section and you were saying something yeah about they took us on a tour right. of the, of the, uh, the jail <laughs> facility there well actually it was i was with some houston folks um okay. shout out to uh, dj hawk and dj ebonics mm -hmm. um we're out there entertaining the troops you know they're they're oh. serving in the middle of nowhere right. they don't have anything to do so they they, they really appreciate you know having a little, a little taste of home so right. but i like to go back i want to know you as a young girl growing up were you born and raised in houston no, no. I, I mean, I'm. Uh, my family moved all over the place, but okay. I, I ended up in Orlando. That's where I. Um, I really wasn't exposed to hip hop until high school. Really. really? And um, in my high school art class, there was a uh, there was a guy who sat next to me who was a really good artist, and he would he brought in that Outcast album that what had was like his the name? Uh, Louis. Oh, okay. Yeah, Louis was a really good artist who would he would uh, draw the cartoon from mm -hmm. the Outcast, like he was kind of copying their comic strip that they had on the I think it was AT Aliens uh, album I think it was their second second album and so we started our, like our teacher was real cool he was like oh you can you know play music or whatever so he started playing it and I I just loved that album I was like what mm -hmm. is you know I, I, I don't think at that point I didn't even really know different Anything, genres of right. music or I was just really just really just a kid who didn't really right. know much about so you music, didn't listen so. to music hardly before that we weren't allowed to listen to music really <laughs> yeah so um, tell me about I, your parents. I had a very, no. <laughs> She's like, no, I don't. You had a very strict upbringing. I had a very strict upbringing, yeah. We weren't really okay. allowed to watch movies or listen to music or anything. So you weren't one of anything, those, so. um, what you call those? The, that they live in their own community, they grow their own. Well, I didn't go to school, school until I was like 14. So oh, okay. I was homeschooled and okay. yeah, I mean, kind of just a very sheltered, like. So how did that feel to you going, you know, to school compared to when you were homeschooled? I'd never been in school before well i mean Do you I think remember being, that i think being homeschooled i actually i learned a lot as More. far as like education wise okay. um i mean i turned out okay i'm like pretty <laughs> smart i guess um but as far as like the socialization and like knowing how to interact with other mm -hmm. people and other you know you definitely miss a little bit of that when mm -hmm. you're not um in a normal school with other kids so um but I, I think it was a good experience overall but it was definitely like an abrupt you know to kind of go to a public school for the right. first time and be like 14 15 and that's not, why i, asked I didn't really know you know the music right. people were talking about or tv shows or whatever mm -hmm. i didn't really know anything pop culture wise so it was definitely like an abrupt you know that's, that's mm -hmm. why i asked because i know a lot of people do homeschool their kids nowadays especially mm -hmm. after covid and so forth and with all of the you know the um shooting and stuff like that in schools a lot of people did choose to um raise their kids at home but i always thought about you know socialization especially if you're an only child if you don't have any more siblings or you're not around cousins mm -hmm. and so forth because in reality yes you're getting them book smart but they're gonna get grown and they're gonna have to know how to deal with society as they get older. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm always well, I do torn think between it kinda that. like It, it kind of taught me to just be an independent thinker because school is kind of, school is really designed to teach you to like be somewhere 40 hours a week and do what you're told. Okay. You know, the, the public school system, right. I mean, that's, it's kind of preparing you for the workplace mm -hmm. where you're just gonna go there from eight to five every day and kind of, put your time in and get your check, you know? But I I think, um, I definitely think a little differently than that, so. Okay. And I, I like to learn, so if you if you have a desire to learn things, I think you can learn it in any 
setting. You don't necessarily have to be, you know, reading a book or in a classroom or whatever to learn. So were you an only um, child? No, I have uh, three siblings. Three siblings. Are yeah. you youngest or oldest? I'm the oldest. The oldest. Yeah. So a lot of things fell on your shoulder. They didn't look looked up to you. Uh, I I would think so. I mean, I I didn't really. Not that they were like bad kids or anything. Mm -hmm. I don't think I was responsible for you know raising them or anything like that. Um, but I was definitely the the oldest who kind of was, you know, mm -hmm. the 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 leader. I guess you could say when you're the oldest. So you would you say up. that your love for the music once you got into the music, your first love was Outcast? Yeah, definitely. And then um, when I ended up uh, starting Ozone, and then I was in Atlanta, they were actually their their studio was across the street from us. So we would you know I would just see. Just see them out, out <laughs> front. So that was kind of cool, like yeah. a full circle kind of moment. To, wow. You know, even to be able to see their, um, I forget what year it was, but they did their big, like, reunion tour. Mm -hmm. They did two, um, two sold-out shows in Atlanta uh, at Centennial Park. So I got to go watch them perform. I, it actually worked out cool because I went one night as kind of like a fan just to watch. And then the second night I brought my camera and did the whole, you know, awesome. be, was able to shoot them VIP status and all that stuff. So I felt like I got the full, mm -hmm. you know, it was really cool looking back. Like, you know, that at, at that point when I first was exposed to their music, like that really put me on to a lot of right. other things as far as hip hop. And so I don't, I don't think I would have taken the direction that I did if not for that, you know, experience. So Shout out to Outkast and then Tupac as well. That was that was the second, you right. know, of course Tupac. Because that was in that era. I think he had maybe just passed or, or, mm -hmm. or right around that time was when I started listening to a lot of hip hop. And and I mean, it's unfortunate that when you know an artist dies, they they do get that exactly. publicity where you know people who might not have been exposed to them previously, you know, started listening. But I started listening to his music and um, really like related to it on a certain level. I I, I think that um, I mean I was pretty naive to like the topics he was actually talking about, like him being you know, a black man and, right. and the experiences he had, obviously I wasn't experiencing that, but the mm -hmm. emotions that he was talking about, I think were things that, you know, everybody can relate to on mm -hmm. some level. And so that's why he had the impact right. that he had, you know, worldwide. And like, even now I went and saw his, um, he has a museum now in Los Angeles. So that, that was really cool to go that's and tight. see all his original writings mm -hmm. and, and just the, the volume of material that he produced, even being, right. you know, so young when he passed away, they have whole, you know, to have a whole museum of his writings mm -hmm. and, you know, not just music, but he had written screenplays and exactly. poems right. and, you know, just to see the volume of stuff that he produced mm -hmm. in his short lifetime was, was pretty cool. Was it, did you have any partners when you first, uh, developed the ozone and ozone magazine was it just you or was it you and no someone? um well the way that the way that ozone came about was uh, originally there was a magazine called orlando source and um mert design was the or mert, mert smith but he went by mert design he was like the the orlando go-to guy that did all the party flyers and he he wanted to take those flyers and you know basically give people a, a way to advertise uh -huh. how old were you when you started it um, when I started with, uh, so I started shooting for him. I did, I, I did some photos for him and I, rather than giving him the photos, I did like a whole layout cause I was kind of trying to learn the software and stuff. And so he was like, oh, well you can come you know, work for me. <laughs> and so I did the, I did the second issue like in 24 hours, like I just sat there and designed it. And then for the third issue, I think because he had to be paid me by the hour, he was like, "Why don't you just be my partner?" And we'll just <laughs> so really, he did, he just didn't want to pay me by the hour. That's really, <laughs> but it was a good it was a good opportunity um, for me. So we did that for about a year, and I think I was probably nineteen at that point. Wow. So I was I was really young. I was um, actually uh, went to college for like a year, and then I mm -hmm. dropped out. So just because I was working and had too much going on, and. I just finished my degree actually during COVID. So. Hey. I'm not a dropout anymore. Yeah, hey. I, I went back and finished. What was your major? Um, psychology. Psychology. Wow. I just want to tell you thank you, man, because during that time I really I watched the the awards. I watched all the stuff that you guys were doing. Mm -hmm. I want to say thank you for the South. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of times you know, and I know how how they would leave the South out, and mm -hmm. and I, I felt that because I'm older. So I would, I was like, man, you know, I thought like when, uh, that was big for me. Well, I think the B, the BT Hip Hop Awards they started doing that because of the Ozone Awards. I'm yeah, not, I do I'm too. I agree with you. I agree that. with you on that. So you know, at, at that point, yeah, there was there was a lot of artists who felt like I think even it might have been Jeezy or one of the artists yeah. that 
got an award like at the first show got up and was like you know i didn't get recognized anywhere else but ozone hey. you know is for the streets represented for us so man you know that first that first year was kind of crazy i to, loved to, it. to answer your question yeah uh, mert was my original partner with orlando source and i even with the first issue he had I, he had taken the actual source logo and just threw orlando on there and i was like you know we can't do that like you can't just <laughs> take your logo so we had changed the logo uh, but me and him like after it was about a year i think we did that and we ended up going our separate ways, but we're still. Let me ask you something. You know, we're cool now, but it, at that point, it, 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 I was going to put out the last issue, and I had a, a friend who said, you know, why would you stop? Like, why don't you just change the name? And so we took the O from from Orlando Source and just changed it to Ozone because that's, that's like a name for Orlando. So Man, right. when I look Ozone. back, I see that picture of me and a Benzino right there. Yeah. <laughs> and you say the source and I think about this research I was doing and the, what he said on that, oh, that yeah, he machine. Me a slut oh yeah. my god. I didn't I didn't think I was gonna get to hear it, but I was listening. I was like, dang, like I didn't know it, you know, until I listened Why to would he tell you that. Oh, he I was on her pretty that. bad. Yeah, they, they had uh, that's a whole other story. <laughs> They had owed me some money. I I did some work for the source, and you know I kept asking them when I I finally ran into to to Dave in Miami. We were going in the same club, and I said, "Hey man, I've been calling the office for months, like about my check. What's going on?" You know, and he kind of like he was like smoking or whatever. He kind of blew smoke out and kind of just looked at me and then walked in the club. And I'm like, "Uh uh-uh. uh, wow." So I I just wrote something slick in the next issue, and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> found their way to them and so late one night and I, it was just funny because I forgot all about it like by the time you you know when you write something and publish it and it comes yeah, out and it hits the streets it, yeah. it's, it's, it's like a month and a half later so yeah. it's like midnight and I, I get this call and somebody's just cussing mm. you know, <laughs> he was cussing cutting up. up so yeah he, he, he had actually called me Benzino had called me that night and I mean for a good hour it was just and I'm like oh would, you talked to him and actually and you didn't hang up the phone on him i found it kind of leave the message though the really so well, what would happen was i was telling somebody about it like he i mean he made all kinds of threats oh, i'm gonna send you know i'm gonna send bitch after you she's gonna crack crack your camera over your head and she's <laughs> gonna and it, was, it was you know when a guy's trying to insult a female and doesn't really have any grounds to go up you know he was like i was probably like 110 pounds at the time he was like you fat bitch and i'm like uh-uh. <laughs> like just he was just pulling anything out anything. to just throw at me and i so i was just listening like this is crazy to get you to react really. but i was telling you know this back when we had like AOL uh, instant messenger or whatever yeah, we were talking yeah, to people. Yeah. so I just remember I was listening to him and I was talking to somebody on the computer like he, uh, a DJ friend of mine I was like you won't believe like Benzino's you know cussing me out right now <laughs> so he was he was like oh I wish you had recorded it I would put it on the mixtape <laughs> so I go to the office and and like a few days later check the office voicemail because nobody he really checked there. it that much but he had called there first and left this message he was like called me a slut monkey I oh it was tough is, i seen it yeah, I, was like, I mean i heard it this morning i was like what the heck i had never heard that so before I, I sent that to, to, the, to my DJ. dj friend and so i think the core djs ended up you know tony neal had the core djs uh like everybody in the country was on his what mailing did, list or whatever so what he did sent Benzino it out. say about it when he heard all of that I, you know i don't know i don't know i mean i've seen him recently we're, we're you know you're cool now we're cool um i didn't really ever take it that personally cause, right you know that's good though that's good because so, it could have went totally opposite somebody could have really took it to heart and did well something. he got sued over you know kim kim osorio sued them over you know i guess a workplace environment not being friendly to women and oh, that was that was okay. one of the examples that they used now i don't know wow. about all the, the the details of that but um yeah <laughs> man yeah. you said um you had um a camp you were taking pictures before even ozone started how did you start being a photographer i've really just always i mean even since i was a kid i've i've always had you know back when i had disposable cameras i was going through you know rolls and rolls mm-hmm. of those so um i just started shooting uh when i was around the time that i started working with orlando source um i remember <laughs> i remember one of my very probably the very first show i ever went to like um mert said you know there's going to be the show at uh capone noriega mm-hmm. at this club and I'm, i mean i'm like 19 i don't know anything about anything i'm just this white girl and so i go to the club like hey i'm here for the show or whatever <laughs> but the i was looking back at my photos because i'm actually going to put a book out of my photography but i have this whole like roll of film where I, w- I get to the concert or whatever and these two guys came in these two like i don't know puerto rican guys and they both had like red 
sweatsuits on, like mm -hmm. matching sweatsuits, and they had a whole bunch of people with them. So I took like a whole roll of film of these guys because I just thought this must be they the cool. right. they're like They look like they're rappers or whatever. And then, you know, of course, later I realized like they're not the ones performing. <laughs> That's They were just some random guys that showed up. But I took like all these photos <laughs> of them backstage. So yeah, I didn't really know um, what was going on uh, in, in music at that time. I was pretty green, but um, I always liked the uh, energy of just watching the crowd like interact with the the artists and not only just hip-hop i mean i used to shoot a lot of like anything that came to town in orlando anything i could get access to i would shoot you know rock concerts and reggaeton and mm -hmm. reggae and um in the beginning ozone was actually a much like wider genres like it was anything that happened in orlando and so we would cover there was orlando is a very diverse um city right, you know right. there's, there's a lot of hispanics mm -hmm. a lot so there's a lot of like reggaeton concerts right. there's a lot mm -hmm. of people from you know haiti and cuba I have a lot of family and, down there yeah florida is very you know you have a lot of influences from the caribbean and mm -hmm. and hispanics and and it's just a really a, a mixed um type of environment so what, we used to shoot like all different genres but what yeah. i'm curious about is the fact that um being white and heading into the hip-hop in industry and being you, a woman and being a woman did, mm -hmm. were you faced with any sort of um racism or classism or does feminine i mean i mean it's, there's definitely like isolated incidents where, right. where where i've gotten some of that um even recently like when i went to the the nipsey uh we were talking about la earlier mm -hmm. like the, the nipsey uh funeral you know right. afterwards i had people you was at the nipsey and, funeral yeah and uh um, how was that uh because i had a guy on here that said they were smoking weed and everything else in there like, it was the, like actual, a party. the actual service yeah yeah, I mean, I don't, me personally, I have a, a belief. I don't shoot concert. I mean, I don't shoot uh, funerals. funerals. Like, yeah. I don't think you should be taking no. pictures and all that. But I mean, they were live streaming it, so I guess. Yeah. It was, anyway, when I was, I took pictures at the memorial, and I had people, you know, people making little comments to me, like, "Ah, oh, white bitches, you know, can't wow. be in here, or whatever." But uh, for the but most how do you part, I mean, that? I, I mean, in the beginning, I I just felt like it was more more of an asset than a than a liability because it's just something that makes you stand out. So right. that's how, how really how I, I knew a lot of the artists was that they would go, you know, like a little John or whatever at the time that was just starting out or just, you know, starting to um, get his music out there. He would see me at like concert in Miami and then he'd see me in Atlanta and eventually be like, like, who are you? Like, right. cause I'm, I stand out. I mean, if you, you know, if you go in the club and there's this white girl with the <laughs> camera, like you're gonna remember. So I feel like it was in the beginning, it was, it was a good thing. Cause a lot of people would just kind of recognize me mm -hmm. cause I would just stand out. So. Um, I definitely didn't, uh, like I said, I, I didn't know anything about really the history of hip hop. So there's been artists who, you know, as I started to like get into the game, like somebody like Scarface would be like, yo, I need to, you need to listen to every song in my, he used to, you know, show me his <laughs> iPod. Like you need to learn about, you know, the history and, and you know, where this sample came from. And I mean, he's right. Like, if yeah. you're gonna, you know, if you're going to be the voice for the, um, for the, the right. culture. How, cause, I saw, Cause I I'm going to say something about him because I saw an article where he did, um, commend you for being one of the one journalist who actually told the whole story about mm. you know the whole culture and everything when people weren't doing that back then people were only doing being one-sided mm -hmm. so he did give you props on that oh that's dope i, I didn't see that but that's, mm -hmm. that's shout out to him yeah he, yeah he well he seriously was like you know the here's my ipod like you, you know and even today like kids hear new music that's it's not new like it's just a sample of something else that's right but, you know it's a generational thing like if you don't know um, that this is the exact same beat that came out 20 years ago right. with a different artist, you know, you don't know the history of it. So um, when it came to like, as far as music reviews and stuff like that, I always tried to assign that to somebody else because I don't feel like I'm the, the right person to do that. So I would have like DJs or, or really knowledge, knowledgeable journalists a analyze actual music. But when I would go interview artists, um, I was honestly just asking questions I was curious about, you know? Let, um, let me ask about, I, I, cause I'm trying to, Grab everything I can. Um, <laughs> you, uh, I seen you on Drink Champs with Jay Prince. How mm -hmm. how did you and him formulate a relationship? As far as you know, just a uh, business type or whatnot. Um, just give me the history on how you guys linked up. Um, well, I guess around the time Ozone started really expanding, because like we we started in two thousand two, but we were pretty much just in Florida. Um, um, so Ozone started in two thousand two, but we were very like central florida focus and okay. we didn't have any money so it was like however many issues we can print up that's however many we're going to put out so the way we started expanding was that um i would be surprised like i put i put a few magazines in a box in miami in a box in tampa 
and we wouldn't really get a, a huge response like from the big cities like you know somewhere like miami they've got three radio stations and they've got newspapers and they have outlets but what surprised me was that like for example like that first you know we put a box out in tampa and we started just getting all these calls from tampa whether it was djs or, or artists or you know people who had stores that wanted to advertise like stores like yours um so cities like that once we started really traveling a lot like cities like tampa or birmingham or mobile like they yeah, didn't have you know the artists in those cities they didn't they, it's very hard to get on you right. know, the clear channel station or whatever is not going to play right. mm -hmm. you know rich boys trying to come out of mobile Man. or you know somebody like that who really does have some some movement and has a fan base but there's not really at, and back then there wasn't twitter and instagram and youtube and all that so they wouldn't really have a platform to Great. you know put themselves out there especially visually you know we, we take things like youtube for granted but back then like you know plies or somebody like that would have a mixtape come out right. and everybody would be playing it mm -hmm. but not know what he looks like or right. you know not really have like that visual aspect so i guess i'm getting off track from your question okay. but um it's okay i'm just glad you're talking so, so, so we started, we had this map on the front of Ozone and it was supposed to represent our, our where we were distributed. And people started, we started getting these angry calls because we, we weren't in Texas yet. But so the map didn't have Texas. And so people would always call and send us right. feedback like, how are you, are you saying this is the South? Like, how are you not including Texas? So for me, I, I don't think I had really traveled, you know, to Texas at that point. So I didn't understand like the culture and the, the reach that you guys have here. Cause right. you, you're really very kind of insulated, but also have a huge, you know, mm -hmm. um, Impact. distribution network. Right. Well, I learned a lot, even researching the Pimp C book, I, le I learned a lot about, uh, was it Southwest? Um, yeah, South South by Southwest. Southwest. No, not the, not the conference, but the, um, the distribution network. Oh yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's South. It, it, that's in Houston, isn't it? Yeah. That, well, they're, I don't think they exist anymore. They don't know more. But they, but they were UGK was actually the first right. like independent project that they distributed, and so I interviewed a lot of artists who would talk about how they, they really weren't pursuing major label deals because they could distribute in Texas and sell like 150,000 albums. So why would you go and give you know exactly. a big chunk of your income away? Mm -hmm. So. Texas had a this huge network, but it it also was like kind of closed off to other. It was very insulated. Um, so, I say all that to say, we started uh, like every month we would get the the magazines. I would literally like I had I think I had like a Corolla back when I first mm -hmm. started out. So we would have like twenty boxes of magazines. And you and it drove. Would be, it would just be on the ground, and so we would drive. We had to, we had a sort of like independent distributors. Right. So it would be somebody like it might be somebody like you who has a store, and you have you know people in the community right. come in, mm -hmm. or it might be like a DJ or a radio station. So we would just go city to city every month, and you know, hey, come meet me at the Chevron. I got a box mm -hmm. for you. You know, so that's how the distribution you know okay. started out because we tried to get in the beginning when I tried to get an actual magazine distributor, they weren't you know mm -hmm. they were like, what is this? This is you know it's a street right. magazine. Um, so rap a lot around the time that we started distributing in Texas was around the same time that I think that they had a deal with, uh, was it Asylum? I think it was like yeah, through yeah. Asylum, Warner. Because Rapalot was kind of, you know, of course they were very known like on the streets. In, oh yeah, in, they've in, been around. In, they started in Texas, again. but they also, they, they weren't, prior to that, I don't think they were doing a lot of like national press, like they didn't really have a, a market, they weren't really like, mm -hmm marketing it in the same way that major labels did so once they linked up with asylum you know that put them kind of under the warner umbrella and labels back then would do a lot of like press junkets where they would reach out to you know all these different um media outlets and and just really put a push mm -hmm. behind the album release so around the time we started doing a lot of stuff in texas was when um i think they put out uh definitely the pimp c solo album I'm gonna be honest. This is going back, 15, That's a ways back. fifteen yeah. years or so. So I'm trying to remember all the specifics. But around like '05 is when I started coming out here a lot. So there was, you know, this is when Mike Jones was dropping. Yeah, and Paul Shout Wall out Mike and Jones, and Paul Wall, and my guys. Who? <laughs> you said Mike Jones. Jones. <laughs> I know. Who? I know. Y'all silly, I man. Yeah, Y'all make me sick <laughs> now. <laughs> what, what, what did well, you think about who was who was? I'm not sure which were which were rap a lot, but around that time, like '05, there was a lot of material coming mm -hmm. out. Swisher House you know, um, rap a lot that was previously, of course, they had been putting material out, but it wasn't getting like the national kind of look. And so yeah. since we were kind of in that system at that time, like Atlantic and Warner and Asylum would, you know, reach out to us. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's when I started doing a lot of stuff with, uh, with rap a lot. And so of course I would, you know, Jay is very, For um, sure. I, I mean, I love the fact Respect. that you know, Jay is always out. Like he, so right. that's how he, he works. knows what's going on. Yeah, like he works. He knows what's ground. going on. Like he's not, you know, 
a lot of executives, you know, kind of will fall back and they'll, they'll just not be him. up in their their mansion or whatever. No. But he, he'll he'll be in the streets and, mm-hmm. and really know what's going on. So. I think you have to when um, you when you like like he was he's always been the guy the go to guy and, mm-hmm. and, and and so you have to know what's going on and I believe he was able to speak to it throughout the years mm-hmm. probably better than anybody else could you know when he come down to hip hop especially when yeah I mean I, I really learned a lot working with him and just just uh, being able to you know kind of observe and see how he handles business and stuff like that so I, I did some work with him um, I mean as far as when we were doing Ozone I would have the opportunity to kind of just tag along with him um, with certain rap lot stuff and then I ended up uh, helping him with his, his book release in 2018 yeah, yeah I was yeah. live I seen, I seen the, the art and science of respect, respect um, yeah. you know, I think he had seen um, what I did with the Pimp with C, the Pimp C. Mm-hmm. project and you know he had, obviously he had all kinds of avenues to put a book out through a major exactly. you know through a major publisher but he was weighing the options like could I just put it out myself and so that's what I so he self published yeah, so well, basically, well, I, I, I basically helped him set up a rap a lot um, arm, you know, a publishing arm to actually put the book out. So he was able to keep it all in house. We did everything, you know, the whole design and um, the whole release and everything. And I, I told him, you know, I, I felt like it fit the rap a lot, you know, rather than you just going and getting a check from somebody right. and then you don't really have full control over the project. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what they had been doing the whole time all those years with the music so it made sense to to do that with the book and, and so at that, that time you had so much knowledge where that was concerned just to be able to teach him and tell him exactly what to do yeah i mean i had you. learned a lot um about the publishing side of it mm-hmm. and so we were able to to put it out independently and have full control over it and um then i helped him put together the the marketing for it so we mm-hmm. ended up i think originally it was going to be like a three-week tour and it turned into like three and a half months you know he he did tons of press mm. oh yeah he was everywhere he was everywhere yeah i want to ask you about the pimp c i want before this, this yeah this, definitely. I, I gotta get her out of here but i gotta ask you about pimp c you met him in prison i mean when he was in prison mm-hmm. and i wanted to ask you about uh just uh the when you met him did you ever even talk about doing any book with him or anything like that or this something that happened way after no, that happened later. Um, but he, uh, even as I was researching for the book and going back and, and reading some, you know, some of our early interviews, he'd even asked me like to help manage him. And I, I wasn't in a, I had so much going when, on. When he first got out of prison, you know, he was kind of talking to me about putting a tour together and, you know, getting all these artists. And I kind of was kicking myself like, you know, did I, did I slip up and miss some opportunities here? Because you had a booking um, agency at that time as well, right? Yeah, I've been doing bookings uh, since 08 as right. well. So kind of overlapped with the, with the exactly. ozone years. I still, you know, I just have a lot of contacts with, um, especially overseas. I, I get a lot of bookings overseas because they don't know necessarily who do I deal with to get mm-hmm. an American act. And they want to know that it's, you know, legit. There's a lot of like scammers who say right. that they're booking agents. Um, so... That's that's definitely a whole other uh, side of the industry, but yeah, pimp. Um, I met him when he was in prison, and that was part of the. You whole, went to visit him. Yeah, that was it. Was part of something that uh, Asylum Warner had put together. You went to okay. the Tarot Unit. Yep. Damn. Yeah. They. Um, How was it going into the Tarot Unit? <laughs> you know, I I walked in there with a video camera, and I've I had a back when I had a day job. My last I haven't had a day job since I was nineteen, but wow. my, my my boss uh, back then he used to always say ask ask forgiveness not permission yeah so, yeah so you it. snuck said, it in not really i just had it in my hand and i said well they didn't tell me that i can't so i'll just walk in with it so i, wow. I had it right there i signed in so i have a i have a video of him in prison um well that that's, com- that's gonna come out with the movie or the documentary or something it should come out at some point yeah <laughs> yeah but um i didn't really know what to expect i didn't know a whole lot about the the whole history of ugk because like I talked about, you know, kind of the generational aspect of it, you know, for me, somebody who's uh, just starting out in the industry in 2002, 2003, you don't really have a concept of what was going on back in the mid 90s or, you know, yeah. so a lot of the research that I did for the book was, was stuff that I was learning for the first time. Um, wow. So when I went to interview him, uh, I had a couple, uh, Matt Sanzala, who, shout out to him, he's a journalist in Texas, and uh, DJ Wally Sparks was our, our uh, music editor at the time. So I would try to rely on people who were more knowledgeable than me. And I, I called them and said, hey, I get the opportunity to go interview Pimp C, you know, tell me everything there is to know. And so based on what they, you know, he was kind of wild back in the day. Mm-hmm. So they, they had me expecting just this, you know, this guy who was just crazy, <laughs> yeah, and, you know, yeah. off the chain. And, you know, I was a little apprehensive, like, okay, I'm going to a prison. This guy's kind of kind of wild. Like, what do I expect? But he was just super mellow and yeah. chill and 
you know um he had uh, his mom talked a lot about you know some of his struggles with, with mental health and you know he had some some drug issues like prior to him going in and i felt like she was really open about all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff so we, you know I, I how long had he been locked book, up when you when you went to see him he must have been in there uh he did six, like four years right he i think it was right around he probably was in there about three years by the time so it was know. almost time for him to come back yeah well it was it was so i was i was seeing him you know just who he was without any of the you know yeah. outside influences mm-hmm. and, and he was he was really like in a clearer headspace and he talked about um kind of being grateful you know i'm obviously this isn't a good thing but it's probably good that it happened to me because i was in, i was out of control and you know i don't know what would have happened if i was still on the streets and so um so he seemed to have like a really good perspective about it and then he ended up coming out um i think probably probably was only a few months after that when he actually got released and so at that point you know there's a whole new generation of kids that are listening to this texas music that are you know listening to mike jones and they don't know the whole history of of uh ugk that you know that the the, the work that they put in to kind of lay that foundation Mm. but they knew because of bun's campaign that he was coming home they didn't a lot of them knew because bun was so hard for him yeah free pmc was the campaign i was one of them i didn't really i heard that but i didn't really know why Mm. okay why why should we free this guy like (laughs) bun b was killing it though (laughs) (laughs) you like did you talk to bun before or during that time or you didn't talk to bun you just went straight to deal with pmc yeah, and we had uh, definitely interviewed Bun as well. Before um, that? Yeah. Okay. They had, I, I believe they both had sol- solo albums that came out, came out around they that did. time. So, yeah. you know, for for a label, if you have a Southern artist that's coming out around this time, 2005, I mean, Ozone was the, the place to go. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so yeah, we had definitely done a lot of stuff with Bun, and um, and he spoke to his mom before you went and interviewed him in prison, or he spoke to his mom after. No, I had never met his mom until after he passed. Okay. Um, I, I, I mean, I always wanted to write a book. Like I was, I don't really want to publish a bunch of books, but I always thought, you know, hey, I should, I should do right a one. book yeah. on the right topic. And mm-hmm. um, so when he passed, I, I really was observing a lot of other things, and you know, the the level of sort of respect that that biggie gets and that tupac gets um being these hip-hop legends who have passed away and i felt like pimp was not yeah. really getting where right were you at when he passed is. i was in new york and what did um, you think when you heard it that morning i asked these kind of questions like well, when I you heard wrote it that, about it in the book um okay I, I was doing a press run for for ozone so i had done uh i think wendy williams and and a couple other shows and, okay um I, I had texted him for some reason or called him and he didn't answer oh, like the night yeah. before and so um wendy day called me the next uh the next morning i always tell her um she, or whenever she calls me now she'll text me first and say nobody died because <laughs> wow. because she we don't, she's a, a legend in hip-hop as well yeah I don't know yeah, if right. familiar with yeah. Wendy day, but it's kind of unusual for her to call me you know i mean even today usually you'll like text somebody first instead mm-hmm. of just calling out of the blue but so i was just surprised to see her call me i was at the airport and or heading to the airport and and i just picked up the phone and she said uh did pimp c really die and you i was, didn't even and know i was like i don't it. think so why would he be you know why would he be he dead um and that's when you know started to call people and w- once it became clear it was like really you know that was really true it mm-hmm. was kind of it's kind of upsetting to me because a lot of people i knew were kind of like a lot of acquaintances were kind of calling me and they sounded like it was like a new, you know, like this is actually somebody I considered a friend. And, yeah. You know, and, and for people to be kind of, I don't want to say excited, but they were like kind of like, oh, did you hear the news? Like it was, you know, just this. Same way they do today when somebody pass away, they start yeah. acting as if they, they already know how to act when somebody passed, especially a rapper. Yeah. This is sad. It's well, a pre I just turning my phone off because yeah. I didn't want to, you know, it was just those conversations you didn't really want to have. And so I, I just remember feeling very um, like kind of like deflated would be kind of right yeah for it because we had this great like kind of momentum going and and when he first got out of prison like he was on a real positive like let's get mm-hmm. all the south together let's do a tour like let's you know show love it to af- each other and it affected bun it mm-hmm. affected bobo it affected steve below who been on this show it affected mm-hmm. a lot of people it, it affected uh pimp and ken it, everybody i've talked to it affected he's a leo uh it even affected that 17 guy what i'm telling you is a lot of those guys, and you notice if you've been studying psychology, it, it takes a toll on you when you lose something, when you got a momentum, you went mm. through it yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, it was like a dual, like I felt sad as as considering him a friend, like somebody of course. lost, but it, but also 
just looking at it from a, a journalistic standpoint and what we lost as a culture Crazy. Mm -hmm. and um I, even more so like when i started researching for the book and really understood like how you know ti and and you know the big timers and like all these these people named him as like that's the reason why you know, we do we man do. it affected jay prince too that's it why. affected everybody, yeah, everybody man so it was, it was definitely a big loss for, for the culture. And so man, it, was a, it affected me. I ain't gonna lie to you. It affected me when he was in prison. I'm a fan. So I'm, I'm steadily, I'm anticipating him getting out. And when he gets out, then this happened. It's like, dang, a double whammy, you mm -hmm. know, then I started thinking about he up there. He was too short. I knew they had, they had songs together. I follow all that. So mm -hmm. it was like, man, you know, it, it hurt. It hurt for us. But in the South, you know, like I said, we already had some, some high heels to climb I'll put it like that mm -hmm. because like I said without you there becomes a bigger hole in what's going on down here you know what I mean did you did you feel the same way that pimp felt about the south being hated on and the things that he felt about the way that you know people looked at us being from the south yeah definitely I mean I could really relate to a lot of the stuff he was saying when I first interviewed him in, in prison you know he talked about um, just this attitude like the, originally I, I could relate to it because originally when I started out, I wanted to work for, you know, the source or double XL. And I, re, I can remember going up there and going to their offices and kind of at that point, it was like, I'm trying to get a job here. You know, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to be a part of this and, and f not feeling welcomed in that sense. And so, you know, Pim talked about that as well. Like originally he wanted to, you know, be a part of hip hop and he felt like they kind of rejected him. Yeah. And so getting to a certain point where it's just like, well, I don't care what you do. I'll just do my own thing. Man. That's the way Ozone and was, cause so that's that's how Ozone really, you know. That's what I think about. Be, what, so. what? How big do you think they would be if it would have been in New York or in California? Ozone. Uh, I don't think it would it would have worked, cause the whole the whole reason was that we were providing a service that was not existing existing down here but if you had the concept and you were based up there and you was providing for the south well the difference was i, I used to go to shows in the south and i, I like plies is one that i remember i remember yeah. going to a show where he had this mixtape out and every there the club was jam-packed you had like 2500 people rapping every single word and he didn't have a deal and i, I remember there's moments like that where I, I just remember looking around and i was i was the only journalist the only photographer oh. there and i and i would wonder like, am I missing something? Like, why is nobody else? You know, they didn't have people on the ground like how we did. Um, wow. They're they're in office in in New York, so they don't really know. And and I carry that with me today. Like, I'm, you know, not without getting into politics and stuff. But I'm shooting some some political campaign stuff like I did yeah. last year. Um, but I always I believe in going on the ground like if you're not yeah. there you don't really know what's going on you could you could do as much internet research as you want but you gotta if you want to know the temperature and how people are feeling there. you gotta like yeah. be in front of them and because being and, a journalist and, and can observe. be very dangerous yeah <laughs> <I bet she'd laughs> you that. don't ever think about it no she <laughs> dangerous how like uh dangerous because okay the the ones that i feel are dangerous is the ones that go like to war just to oh yeah if you're a war photographer for right sure. yeah and to well, write supposed about to that. be kind of an unspoken well there's a know, storm chaser the, the same thing yeah, storm storm chaser <laughs> the same <laughs> it can get dangerous it would get you dangerous, ever do yeah. that yeah <laughs> so, so, you like danger don't you <laughs> to a point i mean i did go, i went to uh afghanistan during the war with, with paul wall when he went he went over there and performed wow how did you like it scared? How did no, you I mean, like we were it? We surrounded with, you know, everywhere we went, we had, you know, snipers Escorts on the helicopter and with us. And, right. and, but that, I mean, that was an experience for sure. Did Pow Wow do a good job? Yeah, they of loved course. it. Oh, they yeah, he it. killed it? Well, he, at that point, I think that some of the bases we were on, there were a lot of people who had been stationed at Fort Hood. So okay. there was a lot of Texas. They loved there, it. So, right. you know, they, what, they what would song come was up hot, and, like, during that time? You know what I mean? This was probably. I'm gonna break them off. Real. 2009 <laughs> that we went. Um, I mean, you know, Paul has a bunch of records. Yeah, he got a lot, man. Grilled man, all this stuff. And he's also like a, just a genuinely nice guy. He's very so, nice like, guy. He's very, very way. approachable. So yeah, I have a lot of people come up and say, you know, I, mm -hmm. I listened to your mixtape. You know, when I was stationed at Fort Hood, and um, you know, just give them, give them a, that taste of home. So being a journalist, w what would you say is the pinnacle of your career so far that you've accomplished? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, as as a journalist, um, I just always like to have control over my material. So I don't I don't do a whole lot of um, writing for other publications. You okay. know, I always just like to do my own, so I can have full control over the images and and the edits and everything. But I probably have to say the Pimp C book. Um, and so how that came about. Um, 
after he passed, you know, it was kind of something that I was thinking about for a while. And I finally asked Bun, mm -hmm. you know, I just called Bun and said, I have this idea. How do you feel? And, you know, he pretty much gave me the green light um, to go ahead with it. And so I, I approached his mom next. Um, and his wife agreed in the beginning, too. That's a whole other story. But <laughs> yeah, I think I heard I, you speak on that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we won't get into that too much. But um, when I went to meet with his mom, I kind of I was kind of nervous, you know, because I hadn't met her before. And I had this whole like kind of, you know, spiel prepared of mm -hmm. how I was going to pitch her on it. We, you know, took her out to eat. And, you know, from the very first sentence, I said, hey, I've been thinking about, you know, doing this book. She was she was just all on board with it. And so I was surprised that she was so, you know, right. enthusiastic about it. And um, as as I got to know her and, and we spent more time, she kind of explained that he had, you know, spoken so highly of me, like from the beginning, you know, when I first went to, to visit him, she, he had called her and awesome. said, hey, I met this, you know, she's got this. Uh, so she already knew about magazine, you. So she had mm -hmm. already heard a lot about right. me. And um, it's funny, actually, because when I, when I went in and I had already sent him some magazines, I think Wendy Day had given me his address or whatever. Mm -hmm. So when I first sat down, you can like hear it on the video or whatever, when I first sat down and, and said, hey, I'm here, you know, from Ozone. He was like, who owns this magazine? <laughs> I, I, I thought he was like mad, like we printed something, you know, wrong, whatever. And I said, I said, I do, you know, and I'm this young white, you know, young white yeah, girl. He's yeah. like, he's like, you, you own this? I was like, yeah, <laughs> it's my magazine. Beautiful. So, um, oh, and you asked earlier, but so about partners, I did have a partner uh, early on, Chino. Okay. Shout out to Chino. He, he uh, was from Orlando and, and um, had a, a record label called DEA. So, but uh, I, I ended up buying him out. I think it was like a year or two in. Um, I mean, he was never fully active. He had like five or six other. Did you, have, you had a rep but, here um, in Dallas named Pookie. Yeah, yeah, shout out to Pookie. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Pookie, man. I, I'm yeah. doing my research here, you know? <laughs> well, I remember, I think it was Manny Fresh said one time that we had so many reps. He was like, hey, man, I was in I was in Africa and this guy jumped out from behind a bush and said he was from Ozone. So. <laughs> So, was, but I hate partnerships anyway. I always feel like if you own, if you're able to monetarily right, write out own something, yeah. do it because two people or three people never have the same passion for it. Well, Somebody's I had so many people try. I mean, like, try like take uh, it from I, had other, I had other people try to try to buy it, and yeah. I was never too enthusiastic about that idea because I just mm -hmm. like the creative, you know, having the creative control. Exactly. I want to ask you about uh, you in Dallas. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that was a that was a song uh, that Pimp C talked about. I know you're strapped. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> I've, I've asked about this song. I've had a lot of different things, uh, hits put out, all kind of. I done got all kind of people. That I got to ask you that. Then I got to ask you about the sex tape. I got to ask you: Had you ever heard of there being a sex tape? A Pimp C? No, that he had. That he had a. That he had of somebody else. Of somebody else. It went crazy like a, in here. That sounds like a, uh, somebody made that up. Made that one. <laughs> I said, what? I'm pimping, like, Pimpin' Ken and Bobo. Oh, you gonna put him out there? And Bobo was on there. Man, they, they spoke yeah. about it, and Pimpin' Ken said he um, he's not a good showed source. it to him. <laughs> she got her sources down, be honest with you. When you went and got the sources, how did you pick who you was going to talk to about Pimp and who was you not so going to talk to? Well, I would interview people, and then I'd go back to Mama West and say, hey. What about this guy? The, the, how, how reliable, how reliable is, is this it? Source? I mean, me and her had conversations about this, because I, I remember saying one time, like, well, why would he just make that up and she was like Julia you 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 know how these people are like people want clout you know what mm -hmm. I mean like people want to be the one to be you know so she would she would give me an honest opinion like hey I wouldn't take everything he says really but she would pick certain yeah, ones she, and tell you but would we she know everything list, yeah. does she did she, she know don't necessarily every, know everything right. but she knew she, a lot she knew a lot yeah though. I know that and see, she wasn't she wasn't only his mom she was their manager, manager like, right. for, for decades mm -hmm. so I mean she was around like she wasn't you know because I've, I've had people give me that kind of feedback before too like well you know they're, they're picturing like just some old lady that doesn't really mm -hmm. know what's going no she she no, was she in was the streets there. like right. she she knew i remember like big gip from goody mom yeah, talking about yeah. like yeah. just seeing yeah well just you know they'd be out on the road doing shows and she'd be the one driving the escalade oh, you know pulling up so she was little ronnie said she was the one getting the money too she, yeah, she, that money right. she made sure the money came <laughs> i gotta ask that's you. one of my favorite stories from the book actually oh she, yeah she talked about the first time she went on the road with them because their their road manager went to jail and these so they're like 18 19 going to do this show and she gets to the club and she said the, the promoter shorted him, like shorted yep. him like $250 yep. or whatever. And she yep. said, I need the rest of the money. Are we not going on stage? Man. And, or, the, I heard the, something the, like that. This before. was in yeah. Dallas, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bobo that. always tells Bo yeah. Not Bobo, it was, uh, who told us Somebody that story? Somebody told that story. I uh, heard uh, that. Uh, Ronnie Spencer told us about that, too. She, yeah. said, she said the club owner was, was being pissy with her, and there's mm -hmm. all, you know, there's all the security around. She's like a grandma, you know, she's right. this little old lady. 
And she said the club owner finally, you know, he, he peeled off the other 250 and he threw it at her. What? Mm. And she just, she said she was so nervous because it's all these security around. She said, she said she told him, when you find a bitch to pick that money up, you let me know. And she walked out. <laughs> so, so that was like one of the first stories she told me. And I was like, I love her already. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I got to know why I know you Before, you, before I got, you say that, how long did it take you to write the book from start collecting till end? So I spent probably three years researching and then another two years kind of kind of filtering it all out together. and um actually you know what's crazy because i i spent the first three years when i was researching i, I tend to get distracted a lot like i mm -hmm. i travel a lot so during that time i also you know i work on it for a week or two but then i'd be you know off in alaska or you know europe or wherever and so i was not making steady progress like i should have been so i actually went to interview somebody for the book and i had my my cameras in the car and somebody broke in and stole my cameras. it happens mm. it happens and um insurance so, but, covers it but i no i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> your well your your homeowner's insurance will cover it it but, sure um, will but then then they're gonna jack your rate up there you to, go to get it that sure will back. yeah you know i got a little yeah. i got a few dollars <laughs> <laughs> i had to re basically i had to rebuy all my equipment and so right. during that time it kind of i kind of looked at it as as a like a forced like sit down and write the book mm. you know and so i so i sat down for you know six months or whatever and but it's crazy because if that had not happened i probably wouldn't have finished um because she she passed away right before it came out yes, she did. Wow. and the last time i saw her she gave me all this we had talked about like this yeah. stuff he wrote in prison so the last time that we she gave uh, it to you the last time that we visited um, like, you know how sometimes you feel like there's an urgency about something and you're not yeah. sure why, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, so I, I was kind of feeling the, an urgency to, to spend the last time I was here, I had been with her like for a couple of days and something told me like, you should stay longer. So I, I ended up staying like three more days and she gave mm -hmm. me just this huge stack of, you know, all this lyrics and stuff that he wrote while he was in prison, a lot wow. of like a lot of stuff that that really ended up being crucial in the book and so she had seen like you know some of the early the drafts, drafts or whatever mm -hmm. but when she was literally like in the i went to see her in the hospital when she you know when she was uh you know in her in her last days and that was that was something she really wanted was her, for her son's story to be told and right. so yeah. that gave me that extra like you know emotional push to be like you better you better stop stop traveling every sit down and finish you know put she wanted this book to, to right. she wanted his story to be told you know, accurately. Um, that was something she really wanted before Last she passed. Last two questions. I, I miss Mama West. She was she Man, was awesome. What she used to cook me dinner and everything while we were doing it. She, so, I guarantee she was, you, I guarantee you, she she looking down on you. And she proud of what she see because I hope you, so, you yeah. oh man, you 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 basically you you did everything right in my eyes, and it well, may not be was, much. She was great to work with. I mean, as as a journalist, when you go interview people. Some people are just, some people have that, that very, that very vivid, you know, sh I would start asking her about stuff and she'd be like, yeah, you know, he was wearing this hat and he turned wow. to me and he had this expression on his, and this is stories about stuff that happened so, 15, so, 20 years ago. Yeah. So her input was, was she invaluable. She was sharp as a whip. She really was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she, she, and she was there for everything. That's good. I want to ask you about, I know you strap. You got to answer that before you get off this uh, show. Okay. I know you strap. Uh, you got to tell me, was that about, was this. that, about, was that? The, about something locally here in Dallas. Yeah. Was it about Master P? Was it? It was a bunch of rumors. I, I got to offer the disclaimer again that this that when we talk about the research I did, we're talking about two thousand. Yeah, that was a long 10. time ago. This was twelve years. Ago. Yes, yes. So you're not as sharp as but, a whip uh, as she is. I'm not as sharp as my <laughs> wife. No. Um, but I did. If you read the book, and the book the book is called Sweet Jones. Yep, yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. Pimp C's True Life Story. You can get it on Amazon. Yeah, Actually, thank we, you so we much. just put out the hardcover. The hardcover will be out uh, in November. You can buy the hardcover. So. I have it here um, in a minute because she got to take care the, of it. The paperback um, has been out for a couple of years now, but. Um, when I researched for the book, everything is is meticulously sourced. So mm -hmm. you can even go to the back and, and reference which chapter, you know, where where did this information come from? Because I'm very serious about making sure that that the story we're telling is accurate. Mm -hmm. um, so I know you strapped. So there there was a situation with somebody in Dallas. Um, again, this has been 12 years, so I'm, I'm uh, I should I should have refreshed my yeah. <laughs> I should have refreshed all the details, but uh I believe it was Ron Robinson was his name. Yeah, yeah, um, I heard that. So there was some kind of I, I never really got the full there was there was an original dispute over some something about a show that they did here where they felt like they were underpaid or there's some kind of yeah. some kind of dispute and then the, he had paid him to do a, a track and then they they there was a dis it was some kind of money or you know yeah. disrespect kind of yeah. kind of issue and 
yeah, that that song was a, a, supposedly he he had contacted Jay Prince and asked for yeah. permission to kill him. That's what I heard. And Jay that, said that, no, <laughs> 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 and, or you know, arranged for some kind of conversation where they could work out you know, the differences. Whatever. But where the confusion came about, I think because he did, and then there was the, the issue with the Master, Master P, P came later. So, but a lot of people heard that record and thought that. Master P, Master P, that it was about Master P, but m the majority of the song is about this guy, uh, Ron Robinson, who's yeah. like a, a promoter. And so there was there was a point in time where, and then there was some other confusion too because um, their former manager had tried to sue them. And so he sent the like, U.S. Marshals to this show mm. in Dallas to try to serve them. And so yeah. they thought that it was related to this other situation. So yeah, Pip, Pip had a yeah, lot of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I heard him, for sure. He shouted some K. Ru and some old people out on this song. He had some specific but, but names. This, this guy, Ron, there's actually an episode of, of SWATS. I think it's the show, one of, the, one of those reality show SWATS yeah. where he, he actually, I think he killed himself on, yeah, on yeah, the show. That. Like well. live, so I actually, I think I went back and watched it. Um, but Pimp saw hit, saw this episode air like years later, so that's that's the guy. Wow, um, he, had, he had been involved in in a murder. I think he had been he had been charged with murder, or and was he about himself. to be charged with murder, and so he barricaded himself in a hotel. Uh, and it's it was been, all um, they had the hostage negotiator out, and wow. yeah, it's crazy. A lot of stuff on the internet talks about Master P and Pimp C and what happened between them early on. A lot of people allude to it being money, uh, some money, mm -hmm. uh, all ki kind of stuff. Did you ever get to the bottom of that you wrote the book so i interviewed master p and he wouldn't he wouldn't talk about it wouldn't talk so about it. when you're when you're a journalist and like i said i try to i try to meticulously source stuff so i interviewed probably you know there were there were several people who were there with well not with him but they you know got the call that night that said something had happened to him there was an incident at, so at something really room. did happen yeah, you think? I, I, well yeah um i mean when i have five or six people telling me, you know, right. his, his mom said he was, you know, she saw him in the hospital and he was, he was beat oh, up. he was he okay. Was, he was he beat, beat up. up. Yeah. yeah. Big so, court. I asked him, was he a part of, he said, no, I don't think he was around <laughs> back then. Well, I, <laughs> no, he was around, but he wasn't yeah. with him, but he, he'd been knowing him a long time, yeah. but that was a long time ago. You well, might be I, right. If I have five or six people telling me that this happened, and they have then like first or second hand right. information and then I have this person who doesn't want to comment on it I mean as a journalist I have to write you know and I'd probably okay. put a little disclaimer you know that they wouldn't uh, speak on it but mm. yeah yeah there was there was definitely a physical altercation that took place man I, but I, that song is mostly not about Master P no 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 I, I know it's about a Dallas thing because he, he actually say he talks about it in the song you know yeah. he kind of specific in that song about what well, he's talking know, about <laughs> I had a little word. I had a little something to say to P because he he mentioned it. He spoke on it on the Breakfast Club. But, I, he, but he called that. me. He called me like some white girl. Yeah. And I said, listen, if you could say whatever, you could think whatever you want to think about me. But if you're gonna speak on me as a journalist, you're not gonna try to make me sound like I don't know what I'm talking How'd about. How did you get the message to him? He came out to a to a signing. That and, we you had and you went and you went up on him. You went up on him. He came out to a to a Jay Prince. Uh, signing oh, oh. Okay. So and he, he he just he, he made a comment about something and I felt like I had to. Respond. I mean, I, I don't really wow. Know. Oh, you're not a problem. You're not shy at all. You, know you, you say whatever's on your no, mind, not, don't that, you? But I feel strongly about that because there are is it, the journalistic standards have definitely declined. Where people just, people on blogs and stuff say will anything. just hear anything mm -hmm. and just. I, I take it seriously. If you're going to put something in print, it needs to be accurate. Or, you know, it's all about how you word it. So I, I may say, you know, this person claims that this happened. We don't know this for a fact, but this is. This is what was alleged. But you gave you know, him an so. opportunity to speak and on it. I did it. give him an opportunity. So that, right. that shows that you're trying to have balance in what you're Exactly, doing. yeah. If you're going to write about anybody, you got to, you know, that's that's a journalistic, you know, standard that you need to give them a chance to respond. So Where's yeah. journalism going? Uh, like I said, I, I feel like it's definitely declined with, with the internet because it's all about clicks and, right. and people wanting to get, you know, they just want to be the first one is to post about away? something. I would say it's going away, but people, it, it also depends on the audience. I mean, people have to have a little longer attention span. Balance. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you're going to um, really research a book and, and dig into it and get the accurate information, it's probably going to take you a couple of years. Yeah, but the no, last but question I had. People don't necessarily on. have the attention span. The last that, question so. I had mm -hmm. is um, other than your own book, you say you're going to come out with your own book. Mm -hmm. um, who else, what other book, what other um, public figure? Are you planning to write for sometimes? Pitbull. Would you like mm -hmm. to write for? Oh, that's a good question too. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't have any other plans like right now. What I've been working on, my book is is like a photography book, so oh, okay. it's like a kind of coffee table. Um, that's a lot of my yeah, my photography and, but I, I tell some kind of you know behind the scenes stories. Yeah, and, stories of what happened. Yeah, I give give a little narrative to it, uh, but that's that's mainly what I'm working on right now. So, Are you Sony, yeah. Canon, or Nikon? 
Uh, Sony <laughs> used to be used to be Canon, but they Sony switched me over. Everybody's to, to loving list, Sony so. now. Yeah, the Sony mirrorless are, are, are they go on. But it, we you nice. see we black magic and all other stuff in here. And I Lumix. see you got all kinds of Lumix uh, and black magic. That's what yeah. you see. <laughs> well, shout out to you guys. Um, congrats on your man. You know, we you've had the store going fifteen. That's years a long and, time. And, Marriage going 20 years? That's, that's, that's <laughs> thank you, Ju- in hey, so. Julia. We working over here, man. We thank you, man. I, I thank you for coming on this platform. I want to thank uh, uh, Bobo I hope for showing. I didn't show. say anything too. I no, say you did a good job. Did Bobo and uh, 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 Big Court. But Bobo first and, and Big Court for sure. Uh, yeah, shout out two to people that, that, that I was. I was say, hey, look, man, you need to get me Julia. She answered my email, but I don't think she's coming, man. You need to make sure figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We love yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad we can make it happen. Man, it's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101, where the bosses talk. And we out.